The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. We have entered a new era of advice with a continuing advisor migration towards smaller and boutique licensees. This new era places a premium on professional development, sustainability, and efficiency. But many smaller practices are finding these goals increasingly out of reach, as it becomes harder to access CPD in a way that is both affordable and makes efficient use of their time. The Ensemble All Licensee Professional Development Day was created to meet this challenge. Born from the thinking of the Ensemble Advisor community, it's a licensee agnostic, one-day CPD event giving you access to 10 hours of CPD accredited content from leading industry experts. You can join this event virtually or join us in Sydney for the in-studio experience. To register, head to ensemble.com forward slash ALPD. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Rachel Holder from Tribeca today. Rachel, thank you for for joining me, particularly on your day off, which we'll get to in a a minute. Um, (laughs) No problem, James. Thanks for joining me. Um, so your role at Tribeca, you're an associate advisor? Absolutely right. Are, yep, that's correct. Are you working through your PY? Like, what are you, what are you up to? What's a, what's a day in your life at, at work like? Totally. Um, do you want the long answer or the short answer? The lo- give us the long answer. <laughs> um, so my history is that I was an advisor in the UK, so it took okay. a number of years, and then moved over to Australia. And based on the timing of when I was advising in the UK, I've had to go through my qualifications again and do the professional year. So um, kindly, Tribeca are helping me with that. So I actually finished my exams last week. So all the study, all the formal studies done. So I'm in the second half of the professional year doing that. So yeah, I'm certainly working as an associate. So um, going back to doing lots of modelling, lots of uh, stuff on Xcon, uh, supporting the advisors there. We have two advisors in for meetings, so I'm still getting a lot of that exposure. So yeah, I'm working through that associate role. Yeah. What's the... Like, is, is there some major differences between working as an advisor in, in the UK versus versus coming out here to Australia? Because, you know, like, I talk to the people that go the other way. Like, there's one of the guys here who worked as an Aussie, did the whole living in London thing yeah, for a couple yeah. of years, worked as an advisor. But I don't often get the opportunity to talk to people that have come the other way. Like, what's it, what's it like for you? It's interesting. I think, I mean, the theory of being an advisor is the same, right? You are speaking to clients, you're helping them, you're putting together financial plans. So I think that that's very much the same. The culture in the industry, I think, is a bit more relaxed here, if I'm honest. And it's nice. I think for clients, it's a bit more approachable, where it's still a bit um, stiff in English, I would say, and the thing, particularly in London. Um, so actually, that general culture around it is a lot nicer. I mean, particularly at Tribeca, I guess, we do a lot of goals-based advice. I think there's a real focus on that. I think that we're more forward thinking here in Australia on that front, as opposed to just thinking about the financial plan. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, your day to day is very much the same. Yeah. Was the the business you were in back in back in the UK was that like more of an investment kind of focused rather than this goals lifestyle approach? Like Trebek, I know Trebek is big on that kind of lifestyle side of things and the investments are part of it. But yeah, but you're kind of leading with the goals and lifestyle. Is that a flip to what you were used to doing before? I'd say it's quite different in the UK. Um, I guess my experience might be the extreme of that because I started in investment management firms. Yeah. So I worked for discussion fund managers, had our own portfolios, and the industry there had gone through a change where we had lots of these traditional investment houses who I guess had realised that you couldn't take the approach anymore of client walks through the door, gives you a pot of money, you don't ask many questions, you just go off and invest it. And I think businesses there and the industry as a whole had realised that actually that probably was a disservice to the client and we couldn't really operate like that anymore. So there was much more of a move towards financial planning. So lots of these investment firms were starting to have financial planning departments of their own. Um, and that's actually the change that both of the businesses that I worked for, the key businesses that I worked for in the UK country. Um, so certainly it was coming more towards that. 
But because of the history of them being investment firms in the first place, that was obviously still a very key part of it. I think we're much more forward in the process here in terms of having other options like index investments that people mm. think about much more. Yeah. And so how did you end up at Tribeca once you've come to Australia? How did you end up? Yeah, good question. Um, I'll drop for a minute here. So <laughs> I I moved over on working holiday visa, then was lucky enough to find a job with a firm um, who had offices in the UK and in Oz, and I did some work for them, actually still under my UK licence for a bit but really wanted to get back into holistic all-round advice, um, and that wasn't really something that was possible there. So I actually went to a Vanguard roadshow, oh, yeah. and Rob, who is our head of advice in Tribeca, was speaking about the process at Tribeca and how they work with clients. And I just liked what he was saying, and I don't have much of a network here at the moment. I mean, it's much bigger now than it was. Uh, we're looking back sort of 12, 18 months when I first got in touch with them and just reached out and said, hey, I like what you were talking about you know, can we keep in touch or have a coffee or something? It just so happened that they were recruiting. Um, that didn't happen immediately. It wasn't quite the right timing. And then a few months later, I ended up going for inter- interviews with them and working with them. Yeah, nice. So how long have you been in Australia then, work- working here? Uh, end of November 22, I moved over and started work in the December. Yeah, okay. So nearly nearly a couple of years. Not not yeah. not that not, not too long, but yeah, coming up two years. That's yeah. a lot longer now. <laughs> uh, and so you, it's no longer a working holiday. You're here. No, <laughs> do you know what? Well, that working holiday did not last for a long time. There was no holiday, and just like <laughs> still um, need to work. <laughs> no, so uh, the first company that worked with here were kind enough to sponsor me. I'm an employee sponsor visa, and try back up now. Um, they're taking that over. Yeah. I'm allowed to stay for a bit longer. Yeah. So then you're in the second half of your PY, which is all about the. Like going to the meetings and doing the presenting and all of that kind of thing, which yeah. I imagine you've got a bit of experience doing that already anyway uh, for, from the UK. It's just working through the motions, ticking the boxes to to, to become an advisor at the end. Yeah, completely right. So, yeah, for me it's been um, – obviously some of those skills get a little bit rusty when you're not using them so much, so it's definitely yeah. been brushing up on that, uh, but more about, I guess – upskilling my technical knowledge here because a lot you know a lot of the theory is the same and a lot of the principles that the two systems work off are very very similar but maybe we've developed products differently all the time mm. which is different so it's been upskilling there and then I guess getting back into you know having the conversations but as I said we have two advisors in every meeting so actually from the very beginning it's been great I've got lots of exposure for those meetings yeah so t- so there's Two advisors in every meeting, plus you, plus a client. Is that what's going on? No, or, so or you're the second two. advisor. Yeah, so uh, associate would be second advisor. Gotcha. Or okay. if there's not an associate available, it would be another advisor. But yeah, just two of us and then the client. Two and everyone. And do you do you record the meetings? How do you do? What do you do? Yeah, you know, okay. still. Um, so we don't do uh, live recording, video recording, yeah. anything like that. Um, we've done it sometimes in the past and have asked clients their permission and generally they've been open to it. But no, at the moment, I think when you have two, it's mm. fine for one of them to be file noting. Um, certainly, when we were talking about it yesterday, if it was just the one person in the meeting, I can definitely see that asking mm. that to be recorded is, is very helpful. And it's like, there's a few businesses that I've spoken to where they use it as a bit of a kind of a coaching and a, and a mentoring thing, particularly for... And you've got you've got a, a bit of experience, but for people that are kind of fresh to it, they're working through their professional year. They're only just starting to talk to clients, yeah. and they haven't they haven't had that experience before. Some people recording it, but then I guess you, it's you know, it's kind of I, I just feel it'd be awkward to say you're sitting across the table from someone to say, oh, "Do you mind if I record it? I'm meeting." No, it's I, different I, when we're on the computer like this talking with yeah, person. It'd be a bit weird. Definitely. I think, yeah, you're right. Much easier when it's out. Actually, the only ones I think I've seen recorded have been ones where the clients haven't been in the office because it just, you kind of forget about it. It's just happening yeah. in the background. But yeah, very odd if you say to a client in a room. Um, but I think you're you're completely right. For people who haven't advised before and you're coming up through that from a social or however you're coming up through the process, that exposure to meetings, I think, is huge. You know, it's not just about how you interact with clients, but you can also see how advisors react to questions, the kind of process they go through. Everybody has their own pattern, right? You can, and, you know, certainly you're not going to take that as exactly what it is, but you can see how people do things differently and then you can develop what you'd like in your own style. It's very hard to do that without the exposure. It is. And and the meetings are all just so different from one to another. Like I've, my, my associate, Julian, who's working with me now, he's in the same kind of 
progress through professional year as, as where you are that that second half and he's coming to a lot of meetings now and, and just this week he, i know he's maybe been, been, been to three or four meetings with me and at the end of it i'm like saying like every meeting has just been so different to, yeah. to the other one it depends what questions clients are getting you know yeah. throwing at you the different scenario that they're starting with you kind of go in there going i want to achieve these things out of the meeting but it takes all these twists and turns i turn oh. back to him i'm like yeah I don't know how you can kind of learn from this because every meeting is just so different to another. Um, you don't realize that until you've got someone sitting there trying to trying to absorb it all from you. Yeah, you're so right because you just go through the motions, right, and do what you yeah. what you do naturally. But I do think for somebody watching that, it's partly it's the way you respond to those questions. You know, it's, sometimes it's not just the technical side, but it's I guess your interactions with the client and how those work. So I think all of that exposure is really really helpful. And mm. now. I was reading on your website and and might have been Nathan that mentioned or something. But so you've got you've done some psychology studies, like like clients. Me, yeah, yeah. Clients often joke about and and it, and it's and it's great to speak to someone that actually has some formal studies in the space. But clients often joke about, oh, you, I bet you didn't think you're going to be a psychologist here, or you know, got <laughs> clients, you got well, clients crying in meetings and whatever. And from time to time, you get these they they, they make these comments and I kind of turn around and say, you know what? You, People come in to talk to a financial advisor thinking it's all about the, the money and the numbers, but it ends up being 90% about all of this other stuff that that Absolutely. no one ever saw coming. And then, yet yeah, there's, there's the 10% about the numbers at the end. Yeah. How have you found having a bit of a background in, in psychology, I mean, I, whatever that is, and I'd like you to yeah. you know, fill us in on what that is and sure. not kind of coming into financial advice? Yeah, completely. So, um, yeah, I studied psychology, uh, I guess, at a levels we have in the UK and then at uni. So I did a degree in psychology and I absolutely loved it. And that was very much my, I guess, the path that I thought that I was going to go down. And um, for a couple of reasons. So uh, I will go into that very, very briefly. But um, basically, the time that I was leaving university, psychology was incredibly popular. And to get on to a doctorate, you basically had to do uh, four years of unpaid volunteering to then try and get on the course that 2% of people got onto. So if I'm honest, I'd never thought about what else I would do. And then I got to that point and, it, you know, we have quite a strong work ethic as a family. Things like gap years have never even been a conversation. The thought of me committing to not working for four years um, to maybe get onto a course just blew my little mind at the time. So um, I pivoted and then really didn't know what to do. So I spoke to, it was actually my dad's recruiter, just to get an idea of what kind of things are out there and ended up working for him um, and was doing that role. And I guess thought that there were some things about that that I found really fascinating. You know, I got to go into businesses and learn all about them, um, why they were recruiting, why they need to need people, their growth plans, that kind of thing. But there were other bits about it that I didn't love. So then I started thinking about, well, what do I do next? And I spoke to a few different people and got speaking to somebody who was an investment manager. Um, and, you know, we talked about there's still the economic part of it, the finance bit that I was interested in, but also this whole area around people and what are they interested in, what are their motivations, what are their goals. Yeah. So that's how I then came into investment management, which then when, as I mentioned, you know, the industry was changing, we were moving more towards advice. I am more naturally the, hey, tell me what you're interested in, as opposed to, what do I think about this stock? So that was that was just a bit more natural for me. Um, and I think that we, it's absolutely right what you've said, that we sometimes think about financial advice as just being about the numbers. And my favourite meetings are the ones where the clients come into the meeting and they've got their sheet of paper with all of their financial assets on it and they start talking about it and then we wind back and say, hold on, let's just, let's go back a step. Like, why, what is this for? Why, you know, what are you trying to achieve? What's important to you? Talk to me about your family. Talk to me about your goals. And sometimes the people who I think you naturally think are not going to love that process because it's not what they expected from an advisor are the ones that really get into it. They give you some really authentic, interesting answers and get so much more from it than I think they expected. So I don't think that you need to in any way have a psychology degree to do advice, but I do think you need to be interested in people. Yeah. And I think that you need to... Uh, you need to care and you need to listen. You need to be open to understanding what motivates them. Um, you know, you can have the best, most technical financial plan in the world, but if you don't understand what the barriers are to somebody maybe implementing that, 
what biases they've got, you know, their past experience of money and how that might stop them maybe acting on this. You know, that that plan that isn't implemented is no use to anybody. Yeah. So I do think you have to you have to be interested, you have to care. Do you find that you're you're putting some of your studies to use in 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 what you're doing? Like do you have a bit of a, a trump card that those of us that haven't done psychology <laughs> have have it and you've got a bit of an advantage there? It's so funny when I am sitting between my colleagues and they're like, oh, she's like analyzing us. I'm not, and that's absolutely not. Uh, so, you know, there's, no, there's no kind of calling card of, oh, you know, you kind of use these tricks and things on people. It's absolutely that. It's just, I think I listen well, mm. if I'm honest. And that's not that's not through studying psychology, but I think it's, it's just understanding that you have to listen to people to understand them to be able to have any kind of influence. And that's the main basic thing that anybody can get to, right? So, I mean, there's, there are things around around risk and behaviours and bias. You know, we talk about bias an awful lot in um, in studies, actually, here. So some of the studies that people go through when they are um, going to be an advisor, one of the topics on that does cover biases, and I think that's well worth being aware of. So not just in terms of kind of the ones that are relating to investing that we think about, but also, you know, what's their family background, that kind of thing, are they bringing things into the situation that we need to be aware of? Um, so that's really relevant. Risk is a big one. Yeah. You know, we talk about that all the time, but I think really deeply understanding people's attitude to risk and how that links them emotionally and their behaviours. But no, sadly, I haven't got any any trump card. I wish I did. <laughs> do, do you have – so I've spoken to a few people at Tribeca over the years. And, uh, do, do you have a bit of a framework for – like working through these biases and, you know, what do you what do you want out of your life and all of those kind of things? Like do you have a structured framework for running those meetings or is it just something that you know you need to care about these things and so you're being interested in the person, you're asking the right questions? Like is that left to individual advisors to be responsible for or do you have a meeting framework and some agendas or tools yeah. or whatever to try and flesh that out so it's a kind of repeatable from for everyone to do the same. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really good question. It's a really good point. Um, so we have a couple of structured things that we go through, particularly in our first meeting, but then also when we have ongoing clients, we'll go through that with them every year. So yeah. um, things around financial well being, so understanding how they feel about their financial well being now. Um, and we break that down in a few into a few different areas, a few different questions. So actually because it can be quite a fluffy word, I think, sometimes, yeah. financial well-being. You know, what does that mean to somebody? If somebody just said to me, how is your financial well-being? I don't think you know how to that to say. Yeah. That's something that we have to stretch around and we break down. And then when we go into the goal setting, because I think certainly in the UK, I don't know about here, but a lot of companies that are, I guess would say they were focused on goal-based advice, it was very much a what's your goal? And the client would say, I don't really know. And they'd say, is it to retire at 65? And they'd go, yeah, sure. And that's how we have done that. So there's, there's a much more structured um, approach to that. And I would say, you know, the vast majority of our first meeting with somebody is actually delving into what is important to you, you know, whether it be 10 years from now, five years from now. Um, so there is this big framework around that. Yep. In terms of the biases, I think that a key thing that advisors can do and there's maybe less structure around this, but because we talk about it a lot, I think that advice are aware of it. And it comes up in the financial well-being element, really, but pointing out to clients that they probably have biases. Mm. Because I think we all as humans think that we're inherently rational and we're not. And, you know, that's not just in finance, but in all kinds of areas, but particularly where it is something that is important to us and it can be emotive. You know, that's where some of our deepest biases come out. So I think even just having an open conversation with a client where you're saying there might be some things going on in the background here that you may or may not be aware of. These are things that we see sometimes. I um, mean, you know, you might have very different approaches to your partner and let's kind of explore why that is and what they look like and it might remove some of those frustrations. Yeah. Um, so I think having a upfront conversation where you say to the client, these things exist and they're playing into this rather than us just thinking in the back of our mind, oh, there might be something going on here. Yeah. You know, it's a good process for them to then work through. Yeah. And that, that financial well-being piece, is that like a a, a a tool or something in the sense of like there's – you're giving the clients a set of questions for them to answer and then you're kind of reporting back on it afterwards? Are you doing it in the meeting with them? What won't it? Do it in the meeting with them. So it's, okay. um, it's a set of questions – 
I mean, that sounds like a questionnaire. It's a bit less like that. But we yeah. so four areas essentially that we focus on and we ask questions around and we ask them to give a score because then that's quite easy to come back to, you know, next year and say you were feeling a fine. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, but also ask them to give some reasoning for why they're feeling the way that they are. Um, and that gives us a really good insight into A, where they're at, where we might need to focus on, so where are their pain points. You know, they might feel really, really comfortable that they're on track to meet their goals in the future. I mean, that's quite rare. A lot of people need some help understanding that. Um, but maybe cost of living has really hit them. And in terms of their spending power today, they're really struggling. So it might give us some focus points on where we're looking at, so maybe we're looking at debt and budgeting and whatnot, and also gives us something to then come back to and refer to what we've done, has it helped them? Um, and it, I think it really helps people to articulate what's important to them and how they're feeling and where they're at, because again, emotions isn't necessarily something that we think about when it comes to finances, but you can have, and I've come across it, you know, we all meet these clients who have significant money and wealth and they have access to really liquid assets and can go off and do whatever they want to do but they don't spend their boiler breaks and they don't spend the money you know they're like me and four jumpers at home right they so there's something going on and sometimes it's very hard for people to articulate that so i think a structured conversation around that really pulls out some of that um some of those things that are probably important to them yeah as you just talking to you now, like you, you don't seem in a, like you're not, but you don't seem like a normal professional year person. Like you're talking with so much experience and stuff. It's like, how, how do you, how are you finding like, and maybe you're just dealing with it, but how are you finding this, this like you've got to go through the motions and go yeah. through the process? Like you, just this conversation we're having now, you seem more than capable of going and being an advisor this afternoon and just running with it. But you've got to go through the motions before you can get your ticket. Like, how have you found that? Very kind. Thank you. First of all, it's been a journey. I'll be yeah. honest. It's been it's been a bit of a challenge for me, um, mentally, emotionally. I'll be honest. Um, and- because you know, I studied for a long time. In the UK, I worked pretty hard, and had actually just got to a point where I was really happy in the firm that I was in, really comfortable advising. Um, and starting to move through that trajectory and to then essentially go back five years, maybe. There was was a time where I was thinking about it every single day. (laughs) And I guess now I've worked through that and I've just come to accept that it is what it is. I actually appreciate that here we are upskilling people, upskilling advisors. I know it hasn't been the most popular thing with a lot of people, understandably, right? Because there are other people who've had to go back and upskill as well. But I see that it's done for the right reasons. So it's been frustrating. And I think that we can do it better in terms of when people are moving over from abroad. So for example, you know, having me do some kind of top-up course on super and how that works, or, you know, the things that are fundamentally different makes complete sense. Yeah, it does. Having me do a course on how to speak to clients has probably been less useful. Um, so I think that there could be some better recognition of prior learning, which isn't great here, if I'm honest. Um, so that would definitely help people moving out of it. And in you know, a professional year, I'm lucky that where I am, I, I'm surrounded by people who I think are brilliant at what they do. So me having exposure to them, you, know, you can always become a better advisor. So, yes, I've done it in the past, but there's a way that we do it where I am now. And also I can learn from the experience of the people there. So there have been frustrations. I'd be lying if I said that there haven't been. But um, as a process, it's probably ultimately going to make me better at what I do. So Yeah. Will you, from when you started to when you finished, will will it be a year for you? Is it taking longer? Like will you, will you get through it reasonably quickly? Because like a lot of the people here, the advisors here that go through it, it takes them longer than a year because they're particularly the last part that interacting yeah. with clients, like they're doing the admin work, that's easy, they're, they're doing yeah. that. But the interacting with clients, building the confidence and just their own confidence as well in, in running those meetings, we find that that part takes a little bit longer. It, just from talking to you, I don't think that's going to – you're going to get through that part pretty quickly. So will you end up doing it over a year or will it take you a bit longer? Yes, yeah, so I think it probably will be a year. But yeah. for that reason, you know, yeah. the, um, I guess it's regaining my confidence in a bit has been because it was, a, you know, a little bit of time that I'd been uh, off the tools, I guess. Um, 
But yes, yeah, so it's just kind of brushing up those skills rather than developing those from scratch. For me, it was the opposite in terms of, I don't know the product providers here. Um, so all of those things that you learn through doing an administrative role to begin with, maybe doing power planning, which is the way that I came up through things in the UK, I don't have that knowledge here. So for me, it's been, you know, big fine see, but who do we like working with? How? So it's kind of been going back and doing that stuff. Um, and in the, so I'm just thinking about comparatively in the UK and the amount of time that it takes, we don't have a formal professional unit. Um, so we have the qualifications that you have to do. And there's actually a higher level of qualification now as well, that if you're working at some of the, um, I guess, bigger firms, you can't just have the base level. You have to go off and do, we call it becoming chartered. Um, mm. So that takes a, you know, quite a long time. Generally takes people, I don't know, maybe up to five years to get all of their qualifications to that level. And you can you can absolutely start advising before that, but you are probably on a continual learning process through that. And as I say, some places you won't be advising until you're chartered. So there's not a formal professional year, but I think that because of that process potentially taking a while, it would take longer and you'd be having exposure to meetings and things like that over a longer period naturally. Certainly in the UK, if you were being advised by somebody who had just in the basic qualifications, I would be wanting to ask questions about well, how long have they actually been working in the industry? Because you could you could do that relatively quickly, and then there's no there's no kind of restraint of well, you have to be supervised by for X amount of time. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so where to from here? Obviously, obviously advising. But what are your kind of hopes and and, and aspirations on 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 that front? Yeah. Great question. Um, if I must, yep. So uh, moving moving back into that, uh, I've had some great exposure to it already. At genuinely love the way that we give advice where I am. So that's exciting to get more involved in that. Um, I've been doing, I've had a year of yes in that I think because I had taken a bit of a step back, had kind of been forced to do that and was a bit concerned about some of my skills maybe being put in a closet. Um, I've just been trying to say yes to everything recently. So um, I'm doing a lot more presenting. Actually, now we do um, some workplace presenting on financial wellbeing. So we go to you know, companies and speak to their employees about um, the principles of financial wellbeing, some things they might be able to do to improve. So I love that. I get a lot of, um, I mean, I have to sit in a dark room afterwards for a while and not speak to anybody. But, <laughs> but you know, that really kind of, that ticks boxes for a lot of things like do you find do you find you like you kind of come off a bit of a high afterwards and then you you, you crash a bit after you've done it definitely i yeah. think i'm probably that classic extroverted introvert right yeah so i can i can do it but you know how some people just get all of their energy from that kind of stuff it takes like it gives me seven but then really takes away so i just need to go and i just need to sit for a bit I'm only a child. I'm not used to being around people all the time, right? Um, so yeah, more of that would be yeah. fantastic. And yeah, just continuing on the on the advice journey. Mm. Now, kind of last question. I can't I can't talk to anyone from from Tribeca without asking how did how does the four day four day work week go for you? It's, uh, <laughs> it was quiet for a while. They, when they first rolled it out, no one no one spoke about it enough. I know it was in one of the industry press or something. But yeah, how, what, what's that like in in practice? Do you find it? that your four days are long hours or is it just more normal hours and you're just that efficient that you can do everything in four days? What What's it like in practice? Good question. It's, um, I mean, I love it. I'm so for it. Uh, it's yeah. something that I haven't had anywhere else. So it it is a transition and I think that definitely some people adapt to it easier than others. Um, and you find a way that it works for you. So absolutely our aim is that we are doing 30-hour weeks. You know, we are just working four days. Clearly, sometimes it doesn't happen like that, right? You know, if you need to put in a few extra hours, you put in a few extra hours. But I think that having the four-day week gives you the flexibility around it. Yeah. You know, um, if we have some people who often do a couple of hours on a Wednesday just because the stuff that they want to be able to do, I guess, with um, more mental space and choose to do that, that just works well for them. And then they absolutely finish on time every day and just don't have to worry about it. You know, I'm on location, do the extra couple of hours on the other days and then have the Wednesday, quite like that, and that break in the week. So people have just found a way that works for them. But, you know, definitely our aim as a business and all of our capacity planning is around people genuinely doing full, normal, standard hour days. Um, mm. yeah. No, it's good. And clients, I 
I think in the beginning didn't didn't tell clients about it, but uh, but then I'm sure they I'm sure they know now. But they they no issues either. Oh, all clients, I don't all think clients they would. know. No, yeah. it's on um, it's on a lot of our emails. You know, uh, yeah. our strap line is my good life, and yeah. we talk to them about you know we are encouraging you to live your good life, and actually we need to think about our employees and making sure that we're optimal for you because we're getting some of that as well. You know, we have lots of people who have young families or have other things that they're interested in. One of our guys is a writer. Um, so it does give people the opportunity to, I guess, fill, I was about to say fill their cup. That sounds very um, very instagram isn't it? But anyway, get, them, <laughs> get what they need from other places so that they can be their best selves at work. And clients just know that we don't work Wednesdays. Our phone lines are monitored. If there's some, you know, a lot of us have an eye on our email. So if there's something yeah. that we need to uh, that we need to do, we will. But clients just know that, you know, we're not there on Wednesdays and they mm-hmm. accept that. And I do think having that set day where we're all off, A is easier from a workflow perspective because I think that if you had some people working and then you just come back on the Thursday and you feel like, oh, everything has just carried on and now I'm behind. Yeah, true. Difficult. But I think also for clients, there's no ambiguity for them in terms of is my advisor there or not? Which day do they do? What day does the other person in the team do? It's not confusing. It's just we don't do Wednesdays and that's that. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way because like it's it's like if you take some annual leave, you know, you, you take a couple of days off and everything else has continued on around you and you and you kind of play catch up that day. That the, the worst. Where, where is uh, whereas, yeah, if, if it's just everyone's off on a Wednesday, it's e- obviously it's easy for the clients to remember, but then – but then the kind of the work stops for for a second, and then it picks up again on the on the day that you come back. Yeah. So you don't you're not everyone's not playing catch up the first day that they do come back from their break. No, exactly. So yeah, yeah I'm a bit, I'm a big, I'm a big fan. Would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Rachel, thank you for joining me, uh, particularly on, on on your day off. It is a Wednesday. This podcast won't go out until a Thursday morning, but it's a Wednesday that we're recording this. So thank you for uh, for doing this on your, on your Wednesday morning. I'll uh, leave you to the rest of your day, I guess. Yeah, no problem at all. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, thank James. you.